Good, y'all. Welcome to Seeds with Wellington Heights Community Church. I'm Pastor Keon. Thank you so much for joining us. I uh, hope you're having a blessed morning. Hey, before we get started, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, the first one is we are having a virtual prayer night uh, on Zoom this Tuesday the 20th at 7 p.m. Uh, it'll be 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, once a month, we have uh, prayer gatherings, either virtually or socially distanced at a park in the form of prayer walks as well. Everyone is welcome to join. If you are interested, please email us at wellingtonheightschurch at gmail.com. You don't want to miss this. I hope to see you there. If you want to get our newsletter uh, to stay updated with what God is doing, uh, upcoming events, ways that you can contribute and participate, again, email us at wellingtonheightschurch at gmail.com. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Would you join us as we enter into worship? Yeah. All right, good morning. Wellington Heights Community Church, it's so good that you asked me to come today. And you know what? It's a wonderful day. It's always been wonderful my whole life, but you know what? My eyes was closed because when you're a little boy, I'm 72 years old, but or young, and you just don't want to believe what mama and daddy had to say. But you know what? I woke up this morning. Well, let me tell you about it. I woke up this morning, got out of bed. I looked around. Here's what I said. Thank you, Lord, for 
another day All these blessings you send our way Thank you, Lord, for another day All these blessings you send my way I could have been dead in some lonesome grave But you told old death, this ain't Halloween Get back and behave Come on, help me out and sing, y'all The Gospel reading for today is Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All of the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please join us as we pray. 
Lord, you have shown us your ways of compassion and justice. Forgive us for being so caught up in our own lives. Forgive us for not having eyes to see and closing them when we do not want to see. Revive your church. Renew us and remake us in your image. Renew us so that we may point others to a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus, you modeled sacrifice and love for neighbor. Deliver us from our anemic and self-focused faith practices. Deliver us from narcissism in our worship practices that center on us and not others. Revive your church. Renew us and remake us in your image. Renew us so that we may point others to a new heaven and a new earth. Holy Spirit, you promise to root, strengthen, and guide us. Fill us with courage to speak out and speak up when we feel weak. Fill us with assurance that you are working in ways we can't always see. Fill us with power to act in love and be the church. Fill us with wisdom as we follow you. Revive your church. Renew us and remake us in your image. Renew us that we may point others to a new heaven and a new earth. Lord, you promise that you are coming back in your fullness to restore and renew. Help us to be made new now and at your full return. Help us to confess together, repent together, and hope together for the church. Help us to live into the reality that we service a God who will make wrongs right. Help us to point to the coming kingdom with our actions and our lives. Revive your church. Renew us and remake us in your image. Renew us so that we may point others to a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. Cry out full-throated and unsparingly. Lift up your voice like a trumpet blast. Proclaim to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. They seek me day after day and desire to know my ways. Like a nation that has done what is just and not abandoned the judgment of their God, they ask of me, just judgments. They desire to draw near to God. Why do we fast? But you do not see it. Afflict ourselves, but you take no note. See on your fast day, you carry out your own pursuits and drive all your laborers. See, you fast only to quarrel and fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Do not fast as you do today to make your voice heard on high. Is this the manner of fasting I would choose? A day to afflict oneself? To bow one's head like a reed and lie upon sackcloth and ashes? Is this what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is this not rather the fast that I choose? releasing those bound unjustly, untying the tongues of the yoke, setting free the oppressed, breaking off every yoke? Is it not sharing your bread with the hungry, bringing the afflicted and the homeless into your house, clothing the naked when you see them, and not turning your back on your own flesh? Then, your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your wound shall quickly be healed. Your vindication shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the accusing finger and malicious speech, 
If you lavish your food on the hungry and satisfy the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom shall become that like the midday. Then the Lord will guide you always and satisfy your thirst in parched places, will give you strength to your bones, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a flowing spring whose waters never fail. Your people shall rebuild the ancient ruins, the foundations from ages past you shall raise up. The foundations from ages past you shall raise up. Repair of the breach, they shall call you. Restorer of ruined dwellings. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from following your own pursuits on my holy day. If you call the Sabbath a delight, the Lord's holy day glorious, if you glorify it by not following your ways, seeking your own interests or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride upon the heights of their earth. I will nourish you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The word of the Lord. According to Isaiah, chapter 58, verse 1 to 14. Hey, thanks for joining me today. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Have you ever stopped and thought about all the things that God has made? He made this earth, the moon, the stars, the planets, all the animals of the earth. He made your mom, your dad, your sister and brother. He even made the stuff that your toys are made of and he gave people the ability to make them. Truly everything that is on this earth is from God. And he gives to us so that we can enjoy them and take care of them. He gives them to us because he loves us. Just like God shares everything that he has with us, he expects us to do the same. It makes God happy when we share with others and teach others. It also makes God happy when we take care of the stuff that he gives us. I remember one time when I was in third grade, uh, my friend forgot to bring his lunch to school. He didn't tell the teacher because he thought he'd be in trouble. When we got to the lunchroom, I looked at him and he was very hungry. And I wanted to share my food with him, but these thoughts came to my mind. He should have brought his school, school lunch to school. He'll, go, he'll be able to get to eat when he goes home. If I give him some of my food, I might go hungry. These thoughts put the blame on him for not bringing his lunch to school. But I remember what my mom told me that Jesus said, treat others the way we want to be treated. If I had made the mistake of not bringing my lunch to school, I would want someone to give me their lunch as well. So I decided to share my lunch with him. God wants us to be sharers like him. Lots of people grow up learning not to share. Instead, they grow up learning to keep what is theirs. They may say things like, if people don't have stuff, it's their fault. With this way of living, we don't reflect the way God wants us to live. We have gifts and talents and things that we are good at, and they're not just for us to enjoy, but to share with others. I'm sure that some of you know how to build blocks or build Legos. Maybe you can help someone else build blocks and Legos, or maybe you don't know how to tie your shoes. Maybe one of your friends know how to tie their shoes. In God's world, all that we have and, and, and all that we learn is meant to be shared with others, not to be kept to, our, to ourselves. So let's share and remember that God shared his son Jesus with us. He took away all of the bad things that we've done 
and he wants to share his life with us. All we have to do is accept what he wants to share with us. And the way to accept his gift is to continue to learn about Jesus as much as you can and believe and follow his ways, and he will help you become more like him. So let's be sharers. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a good day. Good morning. Thank you for joining us at Wellington Heights Community Church. This Sunday, we're going to be unpacking the third biblical key component of Christian community development. So Christ came so that our lives can be totally transformed, not just for us to get a ticket into heaven, but to live as though we are co-creators with him, to work in harmony together, to utilize the gifts he has given us to provide for ourselves, and our communities by the work of our hands. This is part of what God intended for us. God has a concern for our lives here, right now on earth, not just our eternal destination. He is concerned about all parts of our lives, including our economic life. Now, redistribution can be a hard word for some people to hear, want to engage with, or even just understand. Depending on who you are and where you find yourself on the socioeconomic ladder, you may be thinking, yes, this makes sense and it's important. And others may be skeptical and wonder, what exactly are you getting at? The way Christian community development engages conversation and action around redistribution is all about thinking about it through a lens of stewardship and discipleship. Now, before we lose people at the word redistribution, we are not simply talking about taking from the rich and giving to the poor until income has been divided equally among all. Now, Dr. John Perkins, the founder of Christian Community Development, said that if we did that, give it 24 hours and things would be back to where they are right now. Now, this would be as a result of the learned habits, the behaviors, the knowledge or patterns that they already have, or maybe people are locked into broken systems that have forced them or taught them to spend money in a certain way. So if we equally divided things um, just right now, the poor would still remain poor in 24 hours and that those with a lot of resources may in fact have all of those resources intact again in 24 hours. Now the type of flourishing, the type of development and community that you want to see is not going to work just by simply moving money around. That isn't going to um, acquire that deep transformation. Redistribution is looking at our lives, looking at where we spend it, who we spend it with, what we are doing with our time, our talent, and our money, and considering, are we distributing what God has entrusted to us for the flourishing of all? Redistribution is a reordering of our lives, our gifts, talents, money, and time into the order of the kingdom of God ordering it into the values of God's economy, not ours, so that all may flourish. Jesus cares deeply that all may flourish. Redistribution helps us look at our stewardship and our discipleship patterns so that we can move our lives further into the economy of God's kingdom, rather than some of the very broken systems and hierarchies of power in the empires and kingdoms of this world that we have been brought up in. We affirm Psalm 24, which says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. The Bible teaches us that we are not owners, but rather stewards of all the gifts, skills, and resources that God has given us. In many places throughout scripture, we are instructed to share our resources to help those who are less fortunate. In the Old Testament, we see many, many examples of the biblical basis for redistribution. When God created us in his image in Genesis 1, God also set up an economy so that everyone was able to bear fruit by the work of their hands. The economy God set up is a system of managing our households, 
and all the available resources of a community that was in harmony with our relationship to God, self, each other, and all of creation. Now those hiring and those being hired were supposed to be equally valued for the part they played in contributing to the maintenance of the whole. And when human sin and pride perverted that system, God mandated certain rules to ensure that there is enough for those in the community who might be experiencing hardship. For instance, every farmer was only supposed to harvest the fields once and to leave some of the produce behind, like some of the grapes on the vine, for those who had had a difficult year. In order to avoid others going hungry, they are living without basic needs. God's people were commanded to never oppress or rob a neighbor or withhold the wages of someone. God also set up the system of Jubilee in which people were given the opportunity to reset, or you might want to say redistribute their property, wealth, and debts owed so that the economy did not indefinitely advantage some at the expense of others. In Deuteronomy, God charges us that when we see someone in need, instead of being hard-hearted and tight-fisted towards them, to rather be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they may need. Isaiah 58, um, God exposes the shallow worship of his people. In this passage, it's a warning for those of us who go to church, who love to hear good preaching, who observe various spiritual disciplines, whether it be prayer or fasting, and those of us who are concerned with maintaining a good reputation, especially among other church people, right? The decision that God did not accept their fast was that while they were concerning that some, themselves with looking and being religious, they were busy observing these important spiritual practices, but at the same time as doing those things, they were exploiting their workers. They were fighting and quarreling. They were harming the vulnerable by ignoring the needs of the hungry and the plight of the oppressed. As it states in Isaiah 58, the kind of fasting that God desires is freeing those who are wrongly imprisoned, lightening the burden of those who work for you, letting the oppressed go free, and removing the chains that bind people. It's also sharing food with the hungry, giving shelter to the homeless, and not hiding ourselves from the relatives who need our help, which I think we can all relate to probably ignoring a phone call from that one certain relative, right? As we do these things, scripture states that your salvation will come like the dawn and our wounds will heal quickly and that the Lord will lead us and answer us when we call. Our light will shine out from the darkness and the darkness around us will be bright as noon. And that though as we do these things, the Lord will guide us. He will give us all we need for the journey. He will restore our strength and we will be like a well-watered garden as we do the holy and sacred work of rebuilding and restoring the deserted areas of our community. We need to seek God with both sincere hearts and sincere action. Now, as we transition to the New Testament, we hear about the rid religious rich young ruler. Now, in this passage, he walks down the hillside and he asks Jesus, what must I do? to have eternal life. Jesus responded, you must sell everything you have and give it to the poor. In response to this answer, he turned away sorrowfully when he realized that Jesus's words were too costly for him. Just a little bit later in scripture, we hear of Zacchaeus, a hated tax collector, who was a short man who everyone despised. He was a Hebrew Jew and took advantage of his own people. On the day that Jesus was coming to Jericho, he climbed up in that infamous tree to see Jesus. And Jesus paused and said, I'm coming to your house today, Zacchaeus. And everyone in response to Jesus saying he was going to go visit Zacchaeus said that Jesus, he's a friend of sinners. So when Jesus arrives at Zacchaeus' home to share a meal, and during this time together, out of conviction from God's Holy Spirit, says, I am going to give half of my possessions to the poor and give back fourfold of what I've taken out of greed. And in response, Jesus declares today, salvation 
has come to this household. We don't see this in spiritual lost tracts that are often passed out on the street corners, right? Salvation is giving up, which has become a God to us. For the rich young ruler, it was his self-righteousness. Zacchaeus, it was his money and greed and things. One could do it and one could not. Zacchaeus is an incredible model for us. And Zacchaeus, by the way, is the only rich person that comes to faith that we hear about in the New Testament. And according to James 1, verse 27, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God means caring for the orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world's value of power, money, pleasure, and comfort be our driving force. In the context of writing the book of James, James, who is Jesus' brother, is sharing with us that by caring for the marginalized, the church is putting God's word into practice. During the first century, widows and orphans had very little means of economic support. Unless a family member was willing to take them in and care for them, they were willing, they were left to survive on their own with little to no finances. Now it's important for us to contextualize this and consider who is the marginalized population of our society today and how might the church care and come alongside. What does this actually look like today? In Acts 4, verse 32, it says that all believers were of one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything that they had. And Paul instructs the Philippians, do not look out for your own interests, but also take an interest in others too. These verses speak to sharing and exchange, or we might say redistribution of resources, motivated by love for others and a desire to, do, to abide by the scriptural principles. Now at Wellington Heights Community Church, together as a beloved community, we are in it together and for the long haul. God has created us to be relational, to participate in community with one another, now in 1 Corinthians, we hear the scripture say, as it is God's arranged us as members in the body, each one of them as he chooses. Now, if one member suffers, we all suffer together. And if one member is honored, we all rejoice together because we're many members yet in one body. Participating as a beloved community with an incarnational approach we share in one another's joys, burdens, and we look out for each other to ensure that all may flourish. Now, as a new church, we are just now beginning to hear stories of this beloved community forming. As a multicultural and multi-economic community, we are sharing our experiences together, learning from one another, and joining together in some difficult and painful journeys. All that's rooted in the hope of Jesus Christ that will guide us each step of the way. Now, sharing with others can be really complicated. If we're not careful in how we share, we can wind up hurting people instead of helping them. If you have not read When Helping Hurts or Toxic Charity, we highly recommend these two books. Now, the American church has a track record of being our charity being toxic. Too often, the church seeks to helicopter in to save the day with a handout, to take a selfie and a picture and pat ourselves on the back. And this paternalistic approach is also known as a savior complex, which is an approach of coming in to fix and save and rescue rather than having a mindset of mutuality where we recognize the worth and the dignity of each person and where we can freely give and receive from one another. Now, fundamentally, redistribution within Christian community development is all about people sharing their lives with others in ways that bridges the divides of class, race, and culture. Now, coupled with reconciliation and relocation, which we discussed in the previous weeks, if you haven't listened to those messages, go back and give them, give them a listen. Each week is building upon one another. Now, and as a result of relocation and reconciliation, redistribution is just the natural outcome of being a neighbor 
or being in relationships within a diverse community. Redistribution is simply a result of being in an authentic, mutual relationship with those that are different than you. We will continue to share that proximity matters. Proximity allows us to see that in redistribution, everyone has something of value to contribute in the life of a community. Nobody is so broken, so dysfunctional, that he or she has nothing to offer. The key to living this out is to actively recognize the image of God in each person and actually believing that everyone does have something of value to contribute to the table and listening, learning, and building relationships to identify and engage those skills and talents that reside within each of us. Now, identifying these skills and sharing of resources is much more common among the poor than the affluent. Sharing a skill for survival in marginalized community is a skill of survival within poor communities when access to resources are scarce. Those with abundance have a less of a need for others. In fact, the culture of middle class and wealth, it can sometimes be considered embarrassing or inappropriate to ask for help or borrow from a neighbor. It's assumed that every family is responsible for addressing their own needs. Now, much shame can be attached to not being able to provide or meet your own needs in this socioeconomic culture. Now, for some of us, the spiritual work in redistribution is simply just learning how to share, to reorder our lives to one of stewardship rather than ownership. I'll say that again. For some of us, the spiritual work is simply learning how to share and to reorder our lives to one of stewardship rather than ownership. If you've grown up in the church, we have all been taught about the importance of stewardship or the importance of being responsible for the things that God has entrusted to us. However, this interpretation actually makes it quite difficult to distinguish between stewardship and ownership. The idea of letting go, of allowing others to share in the use of my time, my talent, my money, can be foreign to us. This shift in the value of God's economy or the kingdom of God, it's not just a one-time deal. The shift of ownership to stewardship appears to be a lifelong process and journey. At least this is true of me. When Kian and I got married, we committed to always living within a marginalized community. Now, one of the major benefits I immediately saw from the beginning was the identification of resources among the neighbors. It was immediately identified who has a lawnmower, who has transportation, who makes the best collard greens, who has time to help watch the neighborhood kids, who has the ability to help rake leaves or shovel snow in exchange for food or cash. And we all had this recognition that if we had something of extra and someone in our neighborhood was in need, it was to be freely given, whether it's a cup of flour or the use of a lawnmower for an afternoon. Sharing of resources in life is an expected practice in marginalized communities. Now, it's easy for us to condemn the ultra-rich as arrogant or greedy, but this lifestyle of the rich and famous is a lure for average Americans. Expensive cars, nice things, fancy clothes, vacations, and a life of chilling, of ease and comfort lures us all in, doesn't it? This reality um, that we are just lured into this economy of the world rather than God's economy happens whether we are rich, we're poor, or just somewhere in between. In the beloved community, it's a collection of all of our gifts, all of our resources, and all of our voices and perspectives being utilized together, brought together, so that we can be co-creators of God's shalom or peace, well-being, flourishing of all. We must include the poor, the rich, and the in-between, and listen to one another, actually listen. And then we begin to understand each other by hearing one another's concerns and perspectives and thoughts. 
Now, whether right now you're living in an under-resourced community or you're considering relocating or simply you're just pursuing relationships with others who are different than you, we all must give up on the comforts and the rewards of business as usual and the status quo and choose to live in God's economy or the kingdom of God and to pray and actually mean thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To do this, we must also be able to say and live out, my kingdoms go, my empire go, my comforts go. Our value system can no longer be solely based or motivated by money, power, comfort, and pleasure. To keep ourselves from operating by the world's economy, the kingdom and empire and value system, we have to commit ourselves each day to God's kingdom value system, which is an economy of stewardship rather than ownership. And it's here in this upside down kingdom that we find ourselves to be empowered by God's spirit to embody the prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Yeah, Yahweh, I know you are faithful to the end. Yeah. When darkness hovers over me, when I can't see a light, when mountains seem insurmountable, and I can't see the fight, when I have tried everything, exhausted all my might, and life just hits me hard, and there's no end in sight. God, I'm reminded of your faithfulness, and how you promised we'll walk together through all of this. Though I'm suffering now, it's only temporary. Your powerful name crippled our adversary So I will rest in the promises you've given me In his name I will live for all eternity In the presence of the father of kindness I'm covered by his blood, yeah I'm counted as righteous You've been my God, my Lord through it all You've been faithful, Father through it all You know me, you love me, give life to my soul Just a few words from his mouth and he got time going His glory covers the earth, inventing gravity Majestic mountains to mount before his majesty Magically he hung up the stars like they were tapestry Wonderfully he drew up the world and all the galaxies Happily created the earth and did it tactfully Craftfully created mankind and all ancestry And he made the colors, just take that in Measured the length of the heavens with the breath of his hand What's even more, he made you Knows every hair on your head, yes, he has named you. You're worth the death of his son, yes, he has saved you. Oh, he has saved you, and he has claimed you. And all of this, because of love, go ahead and call on his name. He is the Lord. You've been my God, my Lord, do it all. You've been faithful, Father, do it all. When I fall, I am certain you'll answer me right when I call. You're not a genie that grants me my every want and need. You are the God who faithfully takes away my greed and lust and pride. Then plants a seed and helps me grow as a man of God to serve and lead. It's more important to know the healer than being healed. I feel in love with your being, not the power you give. So when I'm backed in the corner, I call the cornerstone. And boldly come to the king who's seated on the throne. I live to worship the king and make his name known. He is the God who will never, ever leave you alone. You've been my God, my Lord, do it all. You've been 